great. All right, that's good. Enough. Very good. In a minute, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, no, Varda, no, no rush. Just to be sure I get it at some point. Great. Okay, so of course, let's start as usual with some breathing meditation as well as the visualization as we usually do it. So let's take a moment to just focus on the breath, letting go any disruptive thoughts. And then to feel inspired, visualize in the space in front of you, the, the Buddha. Preparing as an embodiment of great love and passion. and perfect wisdom. Serving as our refuge at all times. In the form of our Lama, who's inseparable from the Buddha. And then think that the Buddha is surrounded by all the great masters of the past. Who attained realizations, independence on the Buddha's teachings. And also serve as our inspiration. as an object of refuge. Guiding us on the path. I think that in the space in front of you are the great Nalanda masters. Masters of Tibet, and as of other traditions, all of them inseparable from the Buddha, inseparable from your Lama. And seated all around you are all sentient beings, reminding us why we're studying this text, why we're here. All these sentient beings appearing and their different forms, the 
at their different sufferings. But all driven by the same misapprehension of reality. Which gives rise to self-centeredness. And all the other afflictions. And then aware of the fact that the mind of all sentient beings and that of the Buddha, from the point of view, the essential nature does not differ. All our minds are clear in knowing. from the point of view of their basic nature. And so let's generate a feeling of closeness, a feeling of care and acceptance. of all sentient beings surrounding us. A sense of wholehearted, affectionate love. Thank gives way to great compassion, which based on that feeling of affection and closeness, sincerely wishes for all sentient beings to be free from any unwanted experience. And the causes of that experience. And not just that, but a mind, a type of affection that aspires for all sentient beings to be let by myself out of all their suffering, away from all their problems and difficulties. I wish to protect all beings from suffering and its causes. And great compassion then gives way to the altruistic attitude that is determined to do whatever is necessary to free all living beings or to take all living beings to a state of liberation from suffering and its causes. And since that's realistically only possible once we attain the enlightened state of a Buddha, 
Let's generate bodhicitta. The mind that, based on great love and compassion for all sentient beings, wishes to become fully enlightened to be of greatest benefit to all sentient beings. Try to really feel that from the depth of your heart. And think that it's also with this motivation, with this aspiration that will continue to complete today the study of Chandakirti's entering the middle way. And also without letting go of this motivation, this motivating force, let's recite the prayers. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha, to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from happiness that is free from suffering. And may all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends, and hatred for enemies. Reverently I prostrate with my body, speech and mind. I present every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time. And rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence. Turn the wheel of Dharma living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of others to the great enlightenment. Okay, so 
the last time. Well, no, we've got today and then next time some questions if you have questions. But uh, so for this week, again, please continue to focus on well, the mind of enlightenment to generate it as often as you can. Of course, not just to generate the wish to become enlightened, but to make sure you generate great love, great compassion for all sentient beings. So the wish for all sentient beings to be happy and the wish to be able to contribute to that, lead sentient beings to a state of happiness. And likewise, great compassion, so focusing all sentient beings wishing for them to be free from suffering and its causes. And may I be able to contribute to that? May I be able to lead sentient beings to a state of liberation? And then based on that, then generating the mind of enlightenment daily, every morning when we wake up, we do our practice, fasting to generate the mind of enlightenment, maybe even earlier. First thing when we open our eyes, we've got a reminder, something to remind you of that thought. And then of course, during your practice and as many times throughout the day that you remember, maybe use modern, terminal, modern technology to remind you time and again of generating that mind. And to remind yourself as well, at the same time, as you, Allow your mind to be permeated by that love and care. And of course, this wish to become enlightened because of this love, because of this care for sentient beings, to also remember that they don't exist inherently. To take any opportunity, any moment that you don't need to be focused on anything else, take a moment. Well, sentient beings, myself, other phenomena, do they actually exist the way they appear? So that's the importance for um, these concepts to really have an effect on our daily life. We need to repeat them. We need to become familiar with them. And the best way to do them is make them part of our daily life. So that's for this coming week once again. And then to, well, pretty sure we can finish the text today. We got to verse 43, I believe. Um, 44, yes, 44, actually. That's the part of the 11th chapter, the emanation body. We already spoke of the emanation body previously as part of this chapter, but here it's just telling us, Chandrakirti is, is telling us that the emanation body, as we've heard, it emanates uh already previously in the verses previous to this verse we heard it emanates the different lives of the buddha the different um situations uh, in which well the buddha found himself or herself at the time of a bodhisattva being male or female uh the way the buddha practiced at the time as a bodhisattva so manifesting those manifesting the lives of other beings so we learn basically through these manifestations of these different lives and so here it's just saying uh, telling as well a, a buddha an emanation of a buddha manifests of course the life of a buddha how Buddha attained enlightenment so not just the past lives but also manifests the activities of in particular uh, num, um, a, a, what's it called a supreme nirmanakaya so as it's also called a founding Buddha a historical Buddha uh, who uh, performs the, tw- the the ten enlightened or the ten deeds yeah the ten enlightened deeds showing us I mean being born in this world from his mother and so forth uh, all the way up to enlightenment and then up to passing into Paranirvana. So those are the 10 activities of a historical Buddha, of a founding Buddha. But of course, not just that, an emanation body emanates not just that, but it emanates a lot of other teachings, a lot of other situations only to guide us, only to teach us. So in the verse, verse 44, it says, once more, 
you who possess an unchanging body appear in the three worlds. There it is. Once more, you who possess an unchanging body appear in the three worlds. So that's the emanation body. So the one who's attained the Dharmakaya, once more, possess an unchanging body. Unchanging, not that it doesn't change moment by moment, but it doesn't change into something other. It never stops being an enlightened body. It never, uh, it never, well, also never wavers from the meditative active voice on emptiness. So at the same time, remains focused on the ultimate nature of all phenomena appearing in the three worlds. So wherever necessary, emanation, through different emanations who display the different deeds of, for instance, a founding Buddha, a historic Buddha. So in different world systems, in some world systems, Buddhism is no longer around. So in those world systems, those emanations don't emanate the Buddha's deeds because, well, sentient beings don't have the karma to perceive those. But in other world systems, maybe a Buddha is just born, emanates uh, the birth of a founding Buddha in a different world system or in a different world. Uh, there's an emanation of um, the Buddha's enlightenment, displaying enlightenment and so forth. So different deeds are displayed. So then taking birth, of course, turning the wheel of Dharma, the show coming birth, enlightenment, turning the wheel of peace or the wheel of Dharma, um in this way so any desire for fame or reward with great compassion sorry wait um so you also display the deed of turning the wheel of dharma in accord with others mental faculties to help them enter enlightenment to help sentient beings towards the state of enlightenment which is a state of peace uh, so therefore in, in such a way without a desire for fame or reward with this with his great with a great compassion of the buddha you lead other sentient beings to the state beyond sorrow so for all beings indulging in devious behavior and ensnared in a network of expectations or craving so totally beyond sorrow beyond such a state that's what it says in 44 um, and then it goes on to say in 5045 verse 45 well the um, outline here or the, the section that is discussed here is um, that although there's really just one vehicle, there's just one final vehicle in that all sentient beings have the potential to become enlightened, will eventually become enlightened. And still the Buddha set forth different vehicles, different goals, um, so the Buddha didn't just talk of enlightenment. The Buddha also spoke of other goals that once you reach them, you cannot lose them. So different to higher rebirth or any kind of um, higher state within samsara. No, beyond. He taught states beyond samsara, states of liberation, which are, um, well, not just temporary, but once you've achieved them, you can't lose them. But that's just a, well, temporary in the, se in the sense that's, well, not temporary in that you could lose it, but temporary in that there's a greater goal than that, which is full enlightenment. And so there's no other means to dispel, it says in verse 45, there's no other means um, apart from the stains so no other means to dispel all the states exist apart from the knowledge of suchness so these words and the rest of the verse basically establishes that although the buddha taught different vehicles taught the liberation of a shravaka or the liberation of a pratyeka buddha the kind of self-liberation although the buddha taught these states but in the end, there is only the fully enlightened state. And so he gives actually three reasons for why that is the case. First of all, there's only the knowledge of suchness, only emptiness. So apart from the knowledge of suchness, of all phenomena, 
existing non inherently not existing inherently so other than that knowledge there's no means there's no way to dispel all the uh stains or all the defilements the two types of defilements so the defilement to liberation and the defilement to enlightenment so whatever obstructions on our mind whatever whatever is in our mind that's not supposed to be there that's not in the nature of our mind during the at the beginning of this class during the motivation during the time of setting the motivation i talked about that our the nature of our mind is the same as the nature of the mind the mind of a buddha so all sentient beings basic nature the basic nature of buddha's mind is completely free from any afflictions and therefore, these afflictions, whatever is not in the nature of the mind, any stain, any defilement can be removed, but it can only be removed. I'm talking about eradicating, not temporarily suppressing it, but completely eradicating it only by the mind realizing emptiness. So that's what it says in the fast line. No other means to dispel all the stains exist from the knowledge of suchness. And then that such, that's the first reason. There's no other way to eradicate any kind of defilement. The suchness of phenomena admits of no differentiation. This suchness of phenomena, there's no difference. There's no difference with regard to the suchness of any phenomenon. It's just the lack of inherent existence. Of course, it's based on, let's say, a table or a chair or a person. So from the point of view of their basis, there's a difference, but it's just emptiness, it's just the lack of inherent existence. There's no difference from the point of view of just being a mere absence or something that has never existed, but that, but something that we still hold to exist. So emptiness, therefore, suchness of phenomena admits no differentiation. And the subject mind, namely the wisdom that knows the suchness, that realizes suchness, is also undifferentiated. So it's not like the mind is different. Of course, different is my mind or someone else's mind. But in terms of just realizing emptiness directly, any kind of meditative equipoise is the same in that, in that sense. So it may be of a different person, it's a different mind of a different person, but the nature of the mind is exactly the same in just realizing emptiness and no conventional truth in that moment. Well, in the case, of course, of sentient beings and even in the case of a Buddha, from the point of view of just realizing emptiness, from that point of view, nothing else appears. Of course, that mind, being an enlightened mind, can also have the appearance of conventional phenomena, but not from the perspective of focusing on emptiness. Anyway, so from the point of view of just focusing on the emptiness, these minds, there's no difference, which is why, therefore, the Buddha taught to us beings, who are the trainees, a single vehicle, actually a single unmatched vehicle. So the other ones are just temporary. They're just, well, for the time being, he taught these other vehicles, but in the end, there's only one final vehicle. So those are the three reasons. Um, no, no defilement can be eradicated unless, well, it can only be eradicated. Any defilement has to be eradicated by the wisdom realizing emptiness directly. There's no other means. All the other antidotes are just temporary. Secondly, that which this mind realizing emptiness realizing emptiness directly, actually, that mind which experiences emptiness, well, it's object talking of the emptiness of all phenomena, well, they don't differ, these emptinesses. Plus, the mind realizing emptiness directly, any type of mind realizing emptiness directly, they also don't differ. And that being the case, based on that understanding, we can come to understand that there's only one vehicle. That, in other words, defilements can be eradicated, any defilement can be eradicated. The emptiness of all phenomena nothing exists inherently so there's n there's no way that grasping can uh remain grasping can remain grasping at what it's got no nature it's got no basis in reality and of course once you realize emptiness directly well your mind is not different to the direct realization of emptiness in the continuum of a buddha so that's the reason for there being only one final vehicle. And still a question arises in 46, well, 
why are they still why uh oh no sorry um that's not yet yet, yet. but uh the question comes in 47 but anyway so in 46 um therefore it says that the buddhas will do whatever they can um Oh yeah, sorry. It is. It is exactly it. Yeah. So the the question may still arise. It's 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 at this time when that question arises. Why are there these other paths? Why did the Buddha set forth other path um, towards the enlightenment, or the not the enlightenment, but the liberation of a Shravaka or um, a particular Buddha? Why did the Buddha set forth the fundamental vehicle? Well, so long as degenerations different degenerations or um, different folds there are five of them actually um, well there are more than those but yeah so here are five uh, presented that are set to include all the other ones so the five degenerations the generation of sentient beings the degenerations of time afflictions views and lifespan so sentient beings they degenerate uh, the times degenerate, they're degenerate times. Afflictions degenerate. I mean, there are times when there are less of less afflictions. There's certain uh well, yeah, so times degenerating in the sense that there are less afflictions at times. So afflictions can degenerate, views can definitely degenerate. I mean, we all as sentient beings have wrong views, but they can increase. And lifespan. Uh, the lifespan degenerates. So it's according to the scriptures, um, there are said to be times when especially those beings who most who, who can practice the Dharma most effectively, which are human beings, well, when their lifespans uh, decrease, which is a huge problem because if we have only a short life, we don't have the chance to practice the Dharma as effective as, effective as if we could when we have a long life. Or as we can when we have a long life, we live a long life. Um, well, then, of course, our if we really spend our life, of course, practicing the Dharma, well, we can get much further as opposed to just living for a few years and then we we die, we forget about it, and have to start all over again to learn how to, well, speak and read and write, etc. And they're actually said to be times when human beings have a much longer life than the life than the lifespan we have right now so this is uh, still not a longer lifetime there there's talk of different worlds different times anyway um so the lifespan may degenerate degenerate and then of course sentient beings times uh, afflictions and views so when those take place um when these degenerations take place, when they're present in sentient beings, um, they will not enter the profound truth. They will not enter, they will not experience what the Buddhas experience, which is so hard to understand. So there will, those times, and we can look around. I mean, how many people are really interested in Buddhism? I mean, there's some interest, but interest still doesn't mean uh, taking it further. And I mean, there's so many who couldn't care less about the Buddha's ideas, about enlightenment and so forth. There's so few who are interested. And among those who are interested, there's so few who pr pursue it further, who want to study about it, learn about it. And then of those, there's so few who want to practice it, who really want to practice it. And then of those, there's so few who really practice it. So if you think um, the people, the beings in this world, of 7 billion people, like how many people really sincerely dedicate their life to Dharma practice? So because, and why? Because of, well, the degenerations, sentient beings, times, afflictions, views, and lifespan. Anyway, so the Sugata, Sugata, the Buddha, so you, the Sugata, the text says, with your wisdom, knowing, of course, ultimate reality, but also knowing exactly how to benefit sentient beings, how to tame sentient beings, and with your compassionate, skillful means that never forgets about the welfare of other sentient beings, never 
at any point in time does not work towards the benefit of sentient beings. You've pledged in the past that you pledged, you, you took that pledge uh, saying, proclaiming sentient beings, I will free. So I will, my whole purpose, I exist only, my purpose of existence is to free sentient beings. So therefore, it goes on to say, just as a wise captain, so there's this myth of this the story of this this captain who takes sentient beings who takes other people so it's just an example here that's the buddha is like this captain this boatsman if you like who led a, a ship of beings of ship of other of humans to an island of where there were great gems and great riches to, to they led them onto this really long journey and uh, the passenger on that boat, on that ship, they grew uh, impatient, they grew dissatisfied, they didn't want to continue on with that journey. And for that purpose, this particular captain, this boatsman, good, that's how the story goes, manifested these islands where the, the passengers could, well, uh, rest for some time. They could leave the ship, rest some time on these islands until they were rested enough to be able to continue on to Buddhahood. So that's the analogy that is used here so the buddha is like this kind of captain this boatsman who guides sentient beings on that very long journey to enlightenment and so for those beings who are discouraged to feel discouraged to who are not ready uh to aim to dedicate their lives towards enlightenment well for them the buddha also taught uh, these other paths he set forth these other paths of uh, liberation and so this is what it says in verse 47 so therefore just and this is described in the sutra called the sublime dharma of the white lotus so as stated in that in that particular text just as a wise captain to relieve the frustrations of the travelers on a long journey across the ocean journeying journeying to journeying to or traveling to an isle of gems this long journey conjures or emanates images of beautiful towns until the travelers they actually read reach their final goal so in the same way in order for these travelers to be able to rest so you the blessed one set forth vehicles before the shore of the mahayana before getting to the isle of the mahayana or before getting to its enlightenment you also taught the fundamental vehicle and you've done this to soothe the minds of your disciples to offer them relief um and then you spoke differently in a distinct manner to those whose minds are trained in the upper, utter absence of afflictions of cyclic existence. So for some, you taught temporarily uh, the Shravaka goal, and so some, of course, then the great goal. And for those, even for those whom you temporarily taught the goal of Shrav of the goal of self-liberation in the form of the liberation of a Shravaka or Pratyeka Buddha, um, well, even those, for those, eventually you taught them the great vehicle or the the universal vehicle to full enlightenment. Okay, so that's uh, what verse 47 tells us. And then in response to the question, therefore, why did the Buddha, if there's only one vehicle, well, verse 47 and 48, if there's just one vehicle, why did the Buddha still teach uh two more vehicles or actually just one more vehicle the fundamental vehicle which can you can divide into the vehicle of the shravaka and particular buddhas okay but then next is and then the next the next two verses uh chandakirti um well in, in no sorry in the first one verse chandakirti explains the time of manifesting um awakening Okay, so this actually, well, there's like the times, how long, how often, or the, how often, or how long does a, a bodhisattva, does a Buddha manifest enlightenment? Does the, a Buddha manifest over and over again at the attainment of enlightenment? And how long does a Buddha abide in that enlightened state? 
So those two are answered or, or those two are explained. So first in verse 48, the Buddha, sorry, Chandrakirti explains how long, how for how often, how long or how long a time, the, well, the time exactly of uh, manifesting awakening. So in, that means in other words, again and again, emanating how to attain enlightenment. And the answer to that, well, the explanation of that is in verse 48. So as many atoms in all the worlds, in all the worlds of all directions, so any world that exists, however many there might be, that are within the sphere of the sugatas, in other words, whatever can be perceived by the sugatas, which is everything, for that many eons. So basically all atoms, all atoms that exist for the same amount of time, uh, for that many eons, you have entered the enlightened state. So in other words, continuously, there's no end to it of manifesting time and again, Buddha's manifesting time and again, their, 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 their state of awakening. I mean, whether their own or those of others, they continue to show how to, to uh, reach enlightenment. So, but this is seen as a secret. Okay, so as long as all, as many as atoms in all the worlds within the spheres of all the sagatas, however there might be, for that many eons, the Buddhas again and again manifest the enlightened state. It's not like they enter the enlightened state. It's not like they go, go through all over again, but they manifest that. But this secret should not be divulged in words. So this sounds so bizarre and so weird that this is not taught to everyone i mean for instance the fact that buddha shakyamuni in this world 2500 years ago manifested his own enlightenment he was already enlightened he was already enlightened buddha but according to the universal paper according to the teachings of nilalanda tradition well although the buddha manifested uh, in a way in which he was born as a prince, I wouldn't say an ordinary person, but still an unenlightened person, and then manifested his own enlightenment. But in actuality, the Buddha was already enlightened. However, in 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 other traditions, that's not how it's explained. That's not how it's presented. It's presented that the Buddha was unenlightened and then attained enlightenment in that very life. Therefore. This is this is so huge. The fact that the Buddha just manifested um, being an ordinary, unenlightened prince, or at least an unenlightened prince, and then going through the stages to become enlightened. Well, for some people, that's too overwhelming. That seems too much of a fantasy. Too much of yeah, too hard to believe. Therefore, um, it's not to be taught by widely it's not taught in all cases but in actuality that's what the buddhas keep teaching over and over and over just to do whoever it is beneficial if you think that the buddha's mind can manifest anything can manifest like let anything appear whether it appears to us then well that's also dependent on our karma but there's no limit to what a buddha can make appear and if our minds are ready if we have the type of karma to see it well then we we'll perceive it and then that that is what guides us it's those examples it's of course the teachings as well the buddhas also manifest these teachings emanating them in these different emanations but it's also the example which is much more potent i mean if we take our own example of course receiving teachings by his holiness that is so important but just the example of his holiness his holiness's existence um that's why we also like to read biographies for instance or um, and nowadays we've got the the tool of like documentaries about his holiness his life about his activities so that is again an example of emanating awakening oh emanating 
this homeless emanating or is homeless being an emanation if his homeless is a buddha then being an emanation if his homeless is a buddha then his homeless is an emanation there's no question about it. there's no other way because the his homeliness as a buddha the actual buddha would be the sambhogakaya who we cannot perceive we're not in Akanishta, in this pure realm, we're not Bodhisattva Aryas. Well, if you are, then then of course it's different. But for those of us who are not, we're not Arya Bodhisattvas. Well, we cannot perceive the actual Sambhogakaya of His Holiness. And so, if His Holiness is a Buddha, then His Holiness is an emanation as the Dalai Lama. So, showing us again, emanating the path towards the awakening of His Holiness. His Holiness saying I'm just an ordinary person, I've come this far, uh, I've realized such and such. And that is that is in teaching in itself, a very powerful teaching, seeing that understanding or helping us to understand that we can also reach such a state. And of course, then the words just want this teach at the same time also, of course, teaching us. Okay, therefore... This verse 48 teaches us that the Buddhas emanate this continuously at all times. And then for how long do they abide in that awakening? Well, verse 49 tells us as long as all beings, so as long as all sentient beings, this is like the prayer from Shantideva's uh, dedication, as long as sentient, as long as there are sentient beings, um, have not gone to the state of supreme peace, in other words, have not reached enlightenment. And as long as space itself remains, so space remains as the space within sentient, where sentient beings abide, the Buddha, uh, is, who is brought forth by the mother wisdom, who is the result of mother wisdom and who was, was nursed by great compassion. So the Buddha is there for the conquerors who've arisen from mother wisdom and have been nursed by compassion well they continue to be around so there can be no possibility so how can there be the possibility of entering into supreme peace of entering into this the, the state of well not being around in other words there's no way okay so as long as sentient beings have not attained enlightenment as long as sentient there's still space for sentient beings to remain there can be no entrance of conqueror of buddhas to the supreme peace the supreme peace of like not being around not being like nirvana para nirvana in other words that state where they no longer teach um so those sentient those buddhas those buddhas who were brought forth by mother wisdom and nursed by compassion and how what kind of compassion do the buddhas have who care for these limitless sentient beings care for their welfare well that is described in verse 50 sentient beings because of the def because of the defect of their ignorance because of all of us just having ignorance basically of not under not apprehending reality clinging to true existence that's our problem whichever sentient beings whoever whoever they are well, it's clinging to true existence. So the feeding on poison food, feed uh, who feed on poison food. So they cling to the to the objects existing inherently, which of course is the cause for great suffering. So clinging to, to inherent existence, clinging to self, having self-grasping and then all the other afflictions, and that gives rise to suffering. So the extent to which you, you Buddhas are compassionate toward worldly, worldly beings. Is is much greater, uh, much greater than that found in the pain of a mother whose only child has just consumed poison. Okay, so if you think of a mother whose only child has just consumed poison, with the sense of urgency and love and compassion and wanting to do nothing but help that child, so a Buddha. A Buddha's love and compassion towards sentient beings is far exceeded by that. That, that is, I mean, that's the closest, I, I guess you could say, in the human, in, in ordinary humans, the pain of a mother whose child has just consumed poison. But of course, it's even greater than that. So, Savior, Buddha, the, 
the being who protects us, who saves us, basically, do not journey to the supreme one-sided peace. So do they do not choose the state where they just remain in peace in that meditative absorption without emanating Buddha figures without emanating uh, in different ways. Well, as long as sentient beings are in in the situation they're in right now, no way they will pass uh, beyond beyond yeah well their their existence right now. Um, so because of their unskillfulness, it goes on to say. With respect to suchness, there are beings who cling to the notions of the true existence of things, which then gives rise to the pains of birth and destruction. So we are born in samsara. Why? Because of our misapprehension that gives rise to birth and it gives rise to death. And then, of course, all the different sufferings that we experience in between from birth to death, experiencing the loss of that which we want, so, for instance, the loss of loved ones, the gain of that which is unwanted, gaining that, experiencing that which we don't want. Uh, there are beings also who cling to the notion of things don't exist. So they hold on to the non-existence of karma and acting upon this misapprehension, they fall to evil destinies. And so... Therefore, given that sentient beings meet with sufferings, as described before, so this world of beings finds itself within the sphere of the Buddha's, your, your Buddha's great heart's tenderness. So it's this, we find ourselves protected by the great beings. Through your great compassion, blessed one, you turn away from liberation, self-liberation, from peace, this one-sided peace, and forsaking such one-sided piece of nirvana you remain in the world okay so that's what it says in verse 51 it's telling us that therefore um, not only do the buddhas endlessly continue to display enlightenment but more importantly they remain around us well until the end of sentient beings okay so that's just it's nothing new it's nothing that we haven't heard of before and then verses 52 and 53 well they just tell us as these are the kind of conclusory conc conclusions like the, the the last verses well those last two tell us the manner in which this treatise the rest of this text was composed um so this system of the system of inter interpreting the intention of Nagarjuna without distor distortion. So the system is really the system of Nagarjuna. That is the root text for this text. That has been explained, that has been explicated by the monk Chandakirti, the glorious the Chandakirti, drawing from the fundamental wisdom, the, the treatise on the middle way among others so not just that but so other texts so basically he chandakirti he drew from the explained by the so chandakirti's words of course he doesn't talk of himself as the glorious chandakirti that's what lama Tsongkhapa adds when he explains these words uh but basically chandakirti says this was i've explained this Whatever, whatever I've explained here, I've, I've, I drew mainly from the treatise on the middle way, which is the fundamental wisdom by Nagarjuna. And he did so in perfect accord with the definite scriptures, with the not just the inter, not the interpretative meaning of the scriptures, but the definite meaning of the, of the scriptures, and in perfect accord with the oral instructions of the noble Nagarjuna. Okay, so in accord with the scriptures and the oral instructions. So Chandrakirti is basically saying, me, this monk Chandrakirti, basing everything what I said on the treatise of the middle way and other sources, but mainly treatise on the middle way. And I've done so in perfect accord with what the scriptures say, the interpretative teachings of the Buddha. Oh, sorry, the, not the interpretative, the definite teachings of the Buddha. And I've also taught this in accordance with the oral instructions. 
And then he goes on to say, just as outside this tradition of the treatise. So in other words, anything that is outside, that is in contradiction, that contradicts what Nagarjuna said in his fundamental wisdom or in his treatise on the middle way. So it's out, anything that is outside the tradition of the treatise, no other scripture set forth this teaching known as emptiness unerringly as it is. So in other words, if you have a teaching, if you have any text that is in contradiction, that contradicts what Nagarjuna said with regard to ultimate reality, or just in general, whatever contradicts Nagarjuna, does not this scripture set it does not it's not a scripture that sets forth the teaching as it is cannot be a scripture that accords with reality um and also likewise the system that is found here wherein emptiness has been presented on the basis of critical analysis and responses to objection is not found elsewhere so really the root text of all this is nagarjuna's text Within emptiness, nowhere has it been presented in other in other in in any other treatises. So I appeal or learn at once, be sure of this fact. So this we should understand. This is the text to look at. Look at the treatise, the treatise of the middle way, that is Nagarjuna's fundamental wisdom. This is where you find the explanation on emptiness. There is no other system found explaining it differently. There's no other system that explains emptiness in any other way. So we should rely on this. This wish we need to know. Um, and uh, then it goes on to say in verse 54, terrified by the blinding color of the utterly vast ocean, so difficult to fathom of the noble Nagarjuna's wisdom, some people, some people, so some people are just, even though they're great masters, but they are not able, the most profound teachings are not able to understand them and they terrify them. They, they are terrified by these teachings. Um, so there are some who don't realize it. So yet people, so for instance, in the mind only school, those of the mind only school, um, they have shunned basically. Wait, where am I? Oh no, sorry, I'm, I'm, I jumped one verse. No, terrified by the blinding color of the utterly vast ocean of Nagarjuna's wisdom. Yeah. So, for instance, terrified by what Nagarjuna had to say. They're terrified by the profound emptiness. Some people, such as the proponents of the mind only, have shunned and kept their distance from this most wonderful tradition of Nagarjuna. Yet moistened by the dew, these stanzas on the middle way opened like the buds of water lilies. Uh, so some people have shunned them, have left aside the teachings of Nagarjuna and given different Buddhist teachings. So for instance, the proponents of the mind only, they have not, um, they have not, really understood the meaning of what Nagarjuna taught. They shunned it and gave a different explanation. But actually moistened by the dew, these, stun these stanzas, they open like the butts of water lilies. So if you really understand them, then these, stun these stanzas, they're like dew that open the butts of water lilies. Um, well, I guess the, the water lilies of our own wisdom. And that's the hopes of, Nagarj of, of Chandrakirti the author have been realized. So these stanzas of the middle way, um, oh no, sorry, I think moistened by the dew are the, the verses of Chandakirti, I suppose. Uh, he's saying that moistened by this dew, these stanzas on the middle way opened like the bats of water lilies. And with this, with this, with these verses by Chandakirti, he opened, he he's opened the butts of the water lilies of the actual meaning of the uh, text by Nagarjuna. So these are the hopes. That's the hopes of Chandrakirti have been realized. So in other words, uh, he's saying that there are some masters, even Buddhist masters, such as the masters of the mind-only school, 
we've not fully realized, and also the masters of the Svatantrika Madhyamika, but mainly uh, mine only, who are, who although they are greatly, uh, they, they, they're great masters, but they've not fully understood what Nagarjuna talked about. But if it's correctly understood, then moistened by the dew, these stanzas on the middle way, they have opened like the butts of water lilies, and that was the hope of Chandakirti. And in this context, actually, there's a passage that explains this particular verse, verse 54, by Chandakirti, Chandakirti's own self-commentary. He gives this quote in there, or he, he explains it, and this quote is usually given by his holiness. He, he, he quotes this a lot. It's also in Chant in Namatsongkhapa's uh, commentary. It's, it, it, the quote is, if this is so, were the elders, Vasubandhu, Vasubandhu who's actually a follower, at least uh, later on a follower of the mind only, Dignaga and Dhammapala, Dignaga also, well, uh, a follower of the mind only, and so on, Authors of the treatises who appeared at the past, so of course they, they composed very important treatises, they were terrified of merely hearing the sound of the words, prompting them, the words of Nagarjuna, the, the actual meaning of emptiness, of the lack of inherent existence, prompting them to completely abandon this undistorted presentation of the truth of dependent origination. So he puts it forth in, a, in the form of a question. If this is so, were the elders and so forth, did they completely abandon the truth of dependent origination? And in answer to this, yes, indeed, I would say. Okay, so this quotes this gives this quote a lot. So in order to show that although the great Buddhist masters um, those who composed the Pramanavatika or the root text, at least, of the Pramanavatika, who composed these other great uh, texts like Bhava Viveka, like, well, Dignaga, Dhammakirti, although they're not mentioned in the self commentary, but, well, they're also included. Um, these were masters who shunned the actual, well, we don't really know. I mean, in, in that, of course, there could be. Uh, Prasagikas who just didn't, who just manifested as followers of the Mainani and so forth. But the way they appear is as masters of other philosophical systems. And yes, they have abandoned this highest view. We can say that. All right. Um, and so then it goes on to say, well, in verse 55, this suchness this truth of suchness is most profound and terrifying. It's terrifying, of course. If I mean, for us, it may not be so terrifying, uh, but I'm pretty sure that people, if you tell them about emptiness right now, they'd be terrified. Um, just if they if if they don't, well, they either think, oh, that's just rubbish. That's just all. Doesn't make any sense. There's someone just fantasizing about something, or they get what is said. And they're terrified. I mean, of course, our whole existence is based on inherent existence. There's inherently my 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 friend, inherently my family. There's inherently this, inherently that. And then if someone's saying it's not there, well, our whole foundation is taken away from us. And that's terrifying initially, definitely. And if we really understand it as well. So if we're not terrified. Either we've really understood it and we've gone beyond that terror, or, well, we've not really understood it completely correctly. So the suchness, most profound and terrifying, which already has been explained, will certainly be realized by those people who in other lifetimes in the past gained propensities of habituation. So if you hear about it in the, for the first time in this lifetime and you don't have a problem with that and you're drawn to it and so forth, uh, you, 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 you're most likely to have past propensities of habituation, having heard about it before. And so, this is saying, yeah, well, for most people, when they hear about this and they dedicate their life towards it, especially those great masters, well, it's because of past habituation. These other masters, despite their vast learning from having studied many scriptures, will fail to comprehend this profound truth. So in terms of the Dharma, you, we can say that there is the Dharma of emptiness and there's all the other Dharma. And you may be very learned. You will be 
you you may be a great master in all the other when it comes to the other concepts but if you don't have that past habituation to some degree well um you'll fail to comprehend it and these masters are definitely masters of the past who've uh, failed to comprehend it that's seeing those of the traditions as constructed by the with us own mind so these other traditions um, well, of course, the Buddha taught them as well, but then these elaborations by these authors like Dhammad Kirti and Dignaga and so forth, well, th- those are just, those do not accord with reality. They're just uh, constructed by the minds of Dhamma Kirti, Dignaga and so forth. I mean, the Buddha, of course, taught those, but they're elaborated on by Dignaga, Dhamma Kirti, etc., And those, whatever they explain in terms of inherent existence are just constructions, are just fabrications from their own mind, which is similar, which akin to the treatises that fourth propositions of a self. Okay, so basically their their treatises are similar to those who talk about an actual, I don't know, self-sufficient, independent self, even though they may deny that in their scriptures, but it's not that different. And their country, so so sorry, set forth uh, akin to the way in which they would you would relate to the treatises. So the Buddha would relate to these treatises that set forth the self. So the, the forsake their forsake their admiration for treatises and systems of other masters that are con- so. Therefore, you forsake admiration for treatises and systems of other masters that are contrary to this one tradition of Madhyamika. Okay, so the Buddha seeing that this is not correct and similar to the treatises that set forth a self that doesn't exist, you forsake admiration for these treatises and systems contrary to this one. Okay, so that's verse 55 and the verses before that, basically just telling us um, that Chandakirti himself, he has followed the system of Nagarjuna. He's followed the writing of Nagarjuna, in particular, his main text, which is the treatise on the middle way. That is the one we should also follow. And of course, there are these other masters like Damakirti and Dignaga. We should not ignore their their writing, but be aware that the way they set forth, the, the way they present reality, well, that is not the reality um, as presented by Nagarjuna, because they talk of inherent existence, they at least imply inherent existence, and sometimes actually explicitly talk about her. And we should, of course, follow them, follow their, follow their other explanations. But when it comes to emptiness, we need to follow Nagarjuna. Okay, so this is the actual, the, the actual teaching in terms of emptiness which we should mainly focus on. And then the last verse is really just, well, dedication. It's a dedication of merit of having um, taught this text. So Chandakirti uh, dedicates the vast merit that he accumulated. So may the vast merit of speaking about the excellent tradition of the master Nagarjuna. So he's really saying, I'm just talking about what Nagarjuna taught. Um so extremely clearly on the basis of the scriptures and reasoning, may that merit merit that it extends to the edges of space itself. So it's this incredible merit that has been accumulated by Chandakirti. May such merits shine bright as autumn stars amid the mind's sky, turned indigo or darkened by masses of affliction. So that's actually this merit shines bright, but it's darkened by the afflictions. And through the force of the author's mind, having obtained merits resembling a shining gem on a serpent's hood, like the Agajuna's serpent's hood, may every sentient being in the entire world realize suchness exactly as it is and swiftly travel to the Sugata's ground. So in other words, um, through all this incredible merit, um, that shines bright as an autumn sky, uh, but of course is darkened by the afflictions. So and through the force of having obtained merits, this great merit resembling a shining gem, a certain hope may all the entire world, may all sentient beings attain enlightenment. And that's it. Um, those were the last verses. 
I apologize for having raced through it. Um, Oh, we're not there are just a few explanatory verses, uh, words at the very end. We finished the text, but I just want to read the last bit that's still part of the text. Uh, it just it's not really part of Chandrakirti's text. Can you um tell it? Yeah, thank you. So oh, it's not in there. Okay, it's not in there, but never mind. So I'll just read it from uh, what I have here. So this completes entering the middle way, which illuminates the way of the profound and the vast composed by Master Chandrakirti, whose mind is immersed in the supreme vehicle, who is endowed with unchallengeable, unchallengeable wisdom and compassion, and who by milking a drawing of a cow and thus clinging to true existence. That's the story. It's how Chandrakirti is said to have emanated. Uh, he gave some 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 porridge to some beings and because there was no milk so he emanated milk by by um milking milking a drawing of a cow which goes to say that well he's it's a sign of showing that he's beyond clinging to the way things appear and so he's able because of his understanding of reality to even manifest things uh that are extraordinary anyway this text was translated in accordance with the Kashmir edition by the Indian abbot Tilaka Kalasha and the Tibetan translator Venerable Patsap Nimata at the Ragna Gupta Monastery, located in the center of the Kashmiri town Anupana during the reign of King Sri Ayadeva. Later, the Indian abbot Kanakavarma and the, Tibet and the same Tibetan translator compared the translation with the Eastern Bengal edition and made comprehensive corrections with the final version established on the basis of teaching and study. All right, so that's just at the very end. And that's the end of the text. So, yeah, that was what I wanted to do to go through those last verses. I'm aware it was maybe a little overwhelming, a lot of verses, but it's really not that difficult uh, to understand what we've learned uh, through these last verses is really, well, um, Chandakirti saying um, that the, the, you have these emanation bodies, these emanations of the Buddhas who continuously teach us, teach us towards, teach us uh, the path towards enlightenment or to enlightenment. And they, they do so um, based on the the fact that there's just one final vehicle, given the reasons for why there is just one final vehicle and that all the other vehicles are just temporary, that um, the Buddha teaches again and again, I mean, until the end of time, basically, teaches how, on the base of his own example, the way to awakening continues to be around until the end of time, teach the dharma uh, towards sentient beings why because sentient beings are caught in the darkness in their afflictive emotions and the buddha's only goal is to to lead sentient beings to enlightenment and so because of these skillful means because of the skillful means of a buddha so or the buddhas um, they do teach the different path but of course the goal is enlightenment um, Hope I'm not jumping too much. Yeah. And then in the end, it's just telling us, well, this text having been composed by Chandakirti, of course, is all based on Nagarjuna's text. Uh, and then gives us the reason for why this is such an amazing text. This is really what reality refers to. But of course, we should be aware it's difficult to understand it, which accounts for the fact that there are great masters, even well, Buddhist masters who've not understood reality and despite their mastery when it comes to other topics, well, they were not able to realize uh, the actual true intent of Nagarjuna. Yes, all right. Um, and that's basically it. And then there's, of course, uh, the dedication by Chandakirti and that's the end of the text. Uh, so we did it. We went through the entire text. Um, so all that remains is to do some meditation and uh, for next time we'll have 
some questions. If you have questions, we'll meet again next Sunday. We had some, I remember Jimmy had some questions um, and some other people had two, I think. But like I said, I was too busy. I couldn't, um, I, I really, well, couldn't have class in the first place. And I, I also don't know where these emails are. So if you could resend them to the lead. If you've, not, if you've not already done so, if you could resend them and then I'll have, have some questions. And the, after that, um, and I already spoke to DFI about this, Dharma Friends of India, will continue, but with a different text. So DFI needs one month, I believe, um, to get everything ready, right? Laura, is that right? Yes. Um, and so I'm thinking to actually teach Nagarjuna's um, fundamental wisdom, to go through that in the same, using the same or at least a similar format Format of the classes so far. Of course, I actually don't feel qualified, just as I didn't feel qualified to teach this text. So be aware. We'll just study it together, and you should find someone who's really qualified to teach it more extensively and more deeply and so forth. But maybe just as an introduction, uh, we can study it together and uh, yeah, go through these verses, the fundamental wisdom, and not just as sometimes it's done, go through a few verses, but go through everything and see how long it takes. We've got no um, we've got no deadline not to finish at a certain point. So we'll, we'll, just take discuss, a we'll discuss with you the starting date yes, and yes. we'll announce it. Okay. And for the end, after the meditation, if you like, there is a, the, the dedication in the chat box so everybody can read. Oh, okay, the great. Meditation. Thank you. Okay, great. Anyway, I just wanted to say that the reason I already, well, gave that and that made that announcement is because we just read these beautiful verses at the very end where Chandakirti again stresses that this is the root text. So hopefully our understanding now helps us to better understand the next text. Okay, but more information will follow. Having said all that, then let's do a short meditation on what we learned today. Okay, so as before, take a moment to just focus on your breath, be mindful of your breathing, and let go of any disruptive thoughts. So then we should become aware of the fact that Buddhism is actually all about the enlightenment of the Buddha. This is the goal of all the different teachings the Buddha has given. And even the teachings on the other vehicles
and teach self-liberation. The path to such a state is done to lead those who aim for self liberation. eventually to Buddhahood. The reason that there is just one final vehicle. Is that other than the direct experience of emptiness? There are no other means eliminating our defilements. There are no other means to eradicating obstructions to liberation or obstructions to Buddhahood. Also, there's no difference when it comes to the emptiness of all phenomena. All phenomena equally lack inherent existence. And there's also, in terms of the direct realization of emptiness, no difference between the meditative equipoise of, of an area on the Hinayana path, an area on the Bodhisattva path, or Buddha. In terms of directly experiencing emptiness, there's no difference. Therefore, not only do all sentient beings have the potential to become enlightened, but 
Buddha has also worked tirelessly. was leading all sentient beings to that state. And what else do you so? Not just for a short time. But as long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, teaching tirelessly. Driven by perfect compassion, love, sometimes directly or indirectly path to full enlightenment. So is there anything more meaningful in life and to aim to reach that same state of a Buddha? state free from all defilements. State in which our fullest potential has been actualized. Most importantly, state which enables us to most effectively lead other sentient beings towards the state of liberation from all their suffering into lasting peace and happiness. Well, we are self-experience. Perfect peace and bliss. Experiencing conventional ultimate truth 
simultaneously. Unimpeded by any form of misapprehension. And so let's take this opportunity together. Having completed the study of Shandakyati's text. To strengthen and deepen our determination. To become fully enlightened. That is true. Work towards eliminating all the defilements that are not in the nature of our mind. Not just for our own benefit, but for the benefit of all sentient beings. to live our lives based on that aspiration. conclude this meditation, spend a moment just single pointedly focus on that determination, on that aspiration. Come fully enlightened based on the understanding we've gained of the importance of enlightenment. And then, of course, let's dedicate all the words you've accumulated, not just today, but for the last month and years we spent on studying Chandakirti's entering the middle way. May this become a cause for us to fully comprehend emptiness conceptually, understand it, and to be able to develop based on that conceptual realization. 
the direct experience of emptiness. So they are driven by love, compassion, and bodhicitta. We're able to journey through the different path and grounds and eventually become fully enlightened. Let us eliminate all the obscurations that are not in the nature of our mind. that we're really able, most effectively able to benefit others. May this merit also cross our spiritual masters like Ashwamish the Dalai Lama and all the other great lamas to have an extremely, extremely long life. May they remain healthy and strong. So that they can continue to guide us and teach us through their words and actions. And may our virtue also help those beings around us right here and now, all other sentient beings. I help get your prince of to quickly recover. And so may Tali Lubu make a full recovery. And may this cause them many conflicts of this world to weaken and eventually to completely subside. And so let's then dedicate with the words of Shantakirti, the uh, Shantidewa. Just read the prayer. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, attain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer commit evil or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or little with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, 
Until then, may I truly remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Okay, thank you. All right, so please try to remember what I said at the beginning of class. Again, bodhicitta, emptiness. Um, it should be your focus as much as possible, whatever means you find to remind yourself while trying to apply them. Um, and then I'll see you again next Sunday. If you don't have questions, well, at least we get together and dedicate once more everything we've done together. But if you've got questions, you're welcome to send them to Dalit and then I'll try and answer them. Geshema, I hear from Dalit that there are many questions. So it will keep us for the next session at least. And uh, if you have, uh, there is a chance for the next couple of days to write more questions to the lead, if you like. Uh, Geshema will get them for us. Okay. From my experience, uh, there is, uh, uh, I asked twice really silly questions, but the answers were so good. So do not be shy ask questions, it's beneficial for all of us. That's true. Yeah, there are no stupid questions. Every question is, is definitely important to everyone. Um, okay, so yeah, please go ahead. And well, if it takes more than one class, then we may have to add another. That's all right, I guess, uh, if you've got the time. Yeah, and then just send them as soon as you can. Great. And if you think that uh, Dalit doesn't have your uh, mail address, please mail it to her because we'll announce the, I'll announce it again next week, but we'll uh, announce the starting uh, date of the next course in, in the near future. Yeshima, thank you so much. You're thank welcome. you everybody. If you like to uh, donate uh, some dana, you know how to do it. It will be appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Geshema. For having the thank interest. You. And sorry thank again for that long for break. But I hope anyway, everybody is okay. Pardon? I hope everybody is okay on your side. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thank you. See you Good again night, next Mama. week. Good night. Good night. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, DFI. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. And um, Geshima, thank you very much for her. She's not here. She, she by mistake, referred to us as the Dharma Friends of India. I'm so happy. <laughs> Leora, do you have any idea when the next course might start? Uh, it, it will be about a month or so, but we'll see. We just want the time to publish it, to announce it, to publish it, to make it known. But we'll discuss it with Geshima and we'll let everybody know. Okay, thank you. Just, uh, thank you, guys. Just an incredible yeah. news. Yeah.